If there is a second wave of COVID-19 in the U.S. in the fall, or some semblance of it, one saving grace may be how much health systems across the country have learned and continue to learn about emergency preparedness, treatment, and the impact a pandemic has had on the healthcare workforce, especially those on the front lines. Even as the coronavirus is by no means a thing of the past, I think we can agree on that, and cases are mounting in some states where it's possible some in healthcare at least are catching their collective breath and focusing on what it means to take care of healthcare professionals and staff, physically and mentally. Some argue that there's already noticeable psychological impact among healthcare providers as a result of the traumatic events of the past few months, and leaders have to understand this and respond to it. This is our second installment in the Caring for Caregivers special series that's presented by IHI in partnership with Wellbeing Trust, and today we're focusing on specific leadership behaviors and system supports to address and meet staff where they are. We have two people to talk us through why this matters so much and what it can look like. So Joshua Morgenstein is an associate professor and assistant chair in the Department of Psychiatry and assistant director at the Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress in the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences and a captain in the Commission Corps of the U.S. Public Health Service. Jonathan Ripp is Professor of Medicine, Medical Education and Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine, Senior Associate Dean for Wellbeing and Resilience, and Chief Wellness Officer at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And we welcome back IHI's Don Berwick and Derek Feely, our regular expert panelists on these virtual learning hours. So hello to all the panelists. Thanks, everyone, for making the time to share your expertise and perspective. And hello to everyone joining us. We're going to hear from our panel for about 30 minutes, then we're going to turn to Q&A and discussion. You can feel free to chat in uh, questions and exchange ideas, make comments throughout the hour. Uh, we will get to those uh, thoughts of yours uh, in the second half of the show. So we're going to get underway, and I'm going to turn to Don Berwick uh, first. Um, Here's what's on my mind, Don. You know, lending support and legitimacy to a wide range of feelings among caregivers during and after a disaster isn't a new field of inquiry, and I think we're going to, about to be reminded of that. But there is some kind of aha moment going on in healthcare and society at large right now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. How would you characterize what's going on? Thanks, Don. Well, thanks a lot, Madge, and thank you to our guests. I can't wait to hear what they have to say. You know, when I was trained as a physician, um, the signals were pretty different from what they are today. I remember the advice, never, never lay your trip on the patient, is what I was told, which meant leave your feelings at home, leave your personal feelings. If, you, if you're feeling bad or good, it's irrelevant to your interaction with the patient, a kind of heroic view of um, kind of sucking it up as a clinician and keep it to yourself. And I totally understand that uh, the, the patient, the needs of the patient come first. But over the years, I think we've learned more and more and more that if we don't attend to the emotional and psychological needs of the caregiver, the clinician, the patients don't get a fair shake. And by the way, uh, we care about the caregiver as well. That's been in evolution for decades. My own daughter trained as a physician, got a very, very different set of um uh, uh, signals. Uh, I remember her telling me when she was in her anatomy class how they put her in touch with the family of the person who had donated their their body for the for the education of medical students. So there's been some good evolution here, but COVID, like for so many things, has really amped this up uh, as we watch the stress on the healthcare workforce uh, at all levels. Uh, two changes. One is that we're, we're we're even more in touch than we ever had before about the behavioral burdens, the, the, the mental health issues that arise when dealing with a crisis like this. And second, we've definitely broadened our view of what the workforce is and realized the stresses are, are just as great, even greater in some ways uh, for people who don't have the badge of an MD or the degree of an RN. Um, so we, we has broadened our view. I put into the chat a really, really compelling article from uh, June 12th, New York Times by the award-winning journalist Ron Suskind 
uh, in that article, he talks about the experience of clinicians, and um, the article begins with the story of Dr. Lorna Breen, the head of emergency services at a New York hospital, and her suicide, uh, increasing stress leading to the ultimate uh, uh, falling apart of a person's ability to care for themselves. So this is really, really important stuff now. It's always been now even more, and I really look forward to hearing uh, from uh, Jonathan and Joshua as they, they educate us further. Thanks a lot, Madge. Okay, Todd. All right, we're going to start uh, with Joshua Morgenstein. Um, and Joshua and then Jonathan are going to kind of lay out, uh, in some sense, what is their field of study. They complement and overlap uh, uh, with one another. And we invite you to give all kinds of um, attention and thought to um, how this resonates uh, for you and your work experience, uh, what you've been going through directly or the perhaps for the people you're trying to help. So, uh, Joshua, as you look at the last few months, uh, mid-March to mid-June, um, what do you think most leaders got about what their workforces um, were going through, those especially responding on the front lines? And what might they have missed or didn't appreciate or um, understand? Thank you. I'm sorry, Matt, did you want me to answer that first or kind of move forward with this? Well, I guess if it's an okay opener, if you want to jump right into your material and it will sort of, uh, I'm, <laughs> I always like to ask one of these big, you know, questions <laughs> at the top. But feel free if you want to jump right into kind of, how you think about these issues, and we can always pivot back to that question. Maybe it'll become apparent. So go ahead. Yeah, um, well, I'll share some of the, the thoughts that I have and the information with you, and, and I, I think they're important. the question is an important one um, because it requires us to kind of uh, think about lessons learned and applying lessons learned moving forward, and that's going to be really critical um, for the sustainment of caregivers and, as Don points out, healthcare care workers right. more broadly. Great. Um, so these are my thoughts um, and ideas, and I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. Next slide, please. Um, much of what we know about the impact of trauma comes from our study of disasters. Um, and before disorders occur, which is something uh, caregivers and healthcare providers are, are often most focused on, um, and with much greater frequency are things like distress reactions and health risk behaviors, and these create significant public mental health burden. Um, so, for instance, whether or not someone has alcohol use disorder, the increased use of alcohol is associated with a wide variety of adverse public mental health effects like medical errors and accidents, family conflict, work presenteeism. And obviously, these are important issues for organizations, for healthcare, and for our society. It's also important to remember that for the vast majority of people, including people who experience difficulties during the pandemic, they will ultimately do well. And many people will even experience an increased perception of their ability to manage future stressors. Right now, these are particularly helpful messages for ourselves and for our patients. Next slide. Following disasters, communities often progress through well-established phases. Um, understanding the phases and their unique characteristics can really help with things like resource allocation um, and the timing of interventions. Um, outbreaks and pandemics like COVID-19 disrupt these phases. So, for instance, the natural coming together that happens during the honeymoon phase has been altered in various communities by physical distancing requirements. Fear of illness um, has turned into, for some people, fear of others. Um, and communities have been impacted to varying degrees and at different times. So all of these factors complicate response efforts. Um, also, public health emergencies open the fault lines in our society and they lay bare divisions across race, religion, and socioeconomic status. Leaders and other institutional elements within our organizations really play an important role in shaping community response and behaviors. Next slide. Risk overall is, is a relatively complex issue, uh, but we can think of stress kind of like a toxin, um, such as lead or radon. To understand risk and intervene effectively, we have to understand aspects of exposure, such as who, when, how much, and their responses over time. Caregivers that are involved in direct and prolonged patient care 
Um, those exposed to extremes of suffering, as well as human remains and mass death, um, may certainly be at increased risk. And as Don pointed out, it's also important to remember that in this disaster, everyone has been affected in some ways. Um, in fact, those not involved in direct patient care can experience unique stresses um, related to increased work demands, less organizational and community recognition of their work, um, a reduced sense of meaning in the work that they end up doing, and even feelings of guilt for not being on the front lines. Next slide. Following exposure to trauma, we can reduce distress and improve functioning by enhancing a sense of safety, calming, self or community efficacy, social connectedness, and hope or optimism. These elements form the basis of what has been termed psychological first aid, which is an evidence-based framework for supporting resilience in individuals, communities, and organizations. Next slide. There's a lot of information on this slide. Um, but I, I want us to remember it's important to be aware that there are multiple factors to consider for individuals, organizations, and leaders that play a role in the well-being and sustainment of the healthcare workforce. Next slide. COVID-19 has certainly created many challenges for our society, and healthcare workers have experienced additional challenges at home and at work. The scope of this event really requires a whole of healthcare approach to caregiver sustainment. It's good to be alert to the range of needs that people have throughout a disaster and to tailor um, interventions accordingly. So things like instrumental or practical supports are often significant early on. Emotional support is helpful as well, but the reality is that it's often difficult to talk about feeling sad when your stomach is growling and you don't know if you can pay the rent. So I'm going to highlight just a few organizational and leadership interventions that can enhance well-being and sustainment for caregivers and other healthcare workers during COVID-19. Next slide. Buddy systems are not new. So the concept of buddies has been used in different communities to promote safety, efficacy, and social support, which are all protective in a crisis. Um, the battle buddy system, which is a concept popularized by the United States Army, has actually been adopted in some healthcare settings to support the safety and well-being of caregivers. This is more a formal rather than an ad hoc system of peer support. It's um, often particularly useful in a workforce where personnel are often have difficulties asking for help. Um, whether we call it a battle buddy or something else that works better for your organization, Having someone with whom caregivers commit to maintaining a regular, ongoing connection and mutual encouragement can be an invaluable source of support during the crisis event. Next slide. Um, it's important to be aware that communication is not only a means by which we deliver our interventions, but it is in and of itself a behavioral health intervention. Messaging during crisis has a profound impact on community well-being. And it influences people's perceptions of risk and ultimately the willingness of society to engage in recommended health behaviors. Next slide. Resetting is critical to sustainment during prolonged crisis events. Leaders that ensure personnel are both given the opportunity and encouraged to take time to rest, recharge, connect with loved ones, and try to get back to something um, resembling a baseline are likely to have a more positive and productive workforce. Reintegration challenges can also emerge after prolonged exposure to highly stressful environments and separation from families or work units. Um, the study of other professions that share some of these exposures has taught us that the process of reintegrating into work, and home, and society can be challenging. For some people, this aspect of the event may actually be more distressing than providing care on the front lines of COVID-19. Next slide. Some of you are leaders, will be thrust into leadership positions, um, and may even be advising leaders. Um, it's, it's good to remember that leaders exist at many levels, including team leaders, charge nurses, um, service chiefs, department, lead, department heads, and others. What leaders do and say during crisis events has an impact not just on the well-being of their personnel, but also the trajectory of recovery for their community. And grief itself is a near universal aspect of disasters. Uh, the term grief leadership was coined by Dr. Colonel Larry Ingram from the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, following observations of leadership behaviors at military bases that were impacted by the plane crash in Gander, Newfoundland in 1985. 
240 soldiers who were returning home, as well as the crew on board, were all killed in the crash, which remains the deadliest peacetime military air disaster in history. Dr. Ingram and others observed that certain leaders were able to promote healing and recovery within their communities by openly acknowledging and addressing issues of grief, communicating with personnel and, and uh, their surviving family members, facilitating processes that honor losses, and helping people to look hopefully into the future. Next slide. Sustaining hope is difficult, but it's necessary um, for leaders and, and for all of us. Um, and this is not about being Pollyanna. Um, there's got to be an honest recognition of and reckoning with pain, loss, and grief that everybody's experienced. But at the same time, it's important to seek out opportunities which have emerged and to find ways to sustain helpful changes within our system. Sometimes these have been born out of very painful lessons learned. We need to remind people that eventually this will end, and the vast majority of people will ultimately be okay. So our truthfully and authentically balancing all of these things is what really allows communities to sustain a vision of a more hopeful future. Next slide. Uh, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Appreciate a lot of big ideas, and uh, we did ask Joshua to uh, kind of move through a series of pretty profound ideas, um, easier said than done, perhaps, uh, as we continue to evolve and learn. But we'll, uh, we'll uh, dig at into this a little more during discussion. Uh, and yes, just a reminder, everything is shared following today's presentation. Um, everything gets posted uh, to the website. So, um, okay, thank you, Joshua. And we're going to move on now. Um, did we actually, let me just pause for two seconds. I just want to make sure, uh, yeah, I guess we did. So we, we talked about the great leadership part of this. We'll get back to that. I think that's a very interesting concept. All right, uh, Jonathan, you have firsthand experience. Um, with what many doctors to be and caregivers can go through during stressful times. Um, so tell us about the world you've been in uh, for the last uh, few several months um, and what you and your team perhaps have been doing in an attempt to kind of keep up with what providers have needed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to uh, be with you today. And uh, and, and to follow uh, to follow Josh, in fact, um, you know, I, I want to. Uh, I definitely am going to answer your question, but I want to first uh, thank uh, thank Josh, um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. Number one, um, uh, those of us in the well-being world, you know, ex expressions of gratitude are good for our own well-being, so um, it's helpful for me to do that. But uh, often, uh, those of us in, in this space. Um, don't necessarily always see the impacts of, of our work. And what I will say is I've had the fortune of, of uh, being on a panel before with, with Josh and having had uh, a couple of conversations with him in the midst of this. And, um, and a lot of what he has said um, led to real-time uh, changes and adoption of, of some of the practices we put in place uh, at Mount Sinai. Um, I also want to uh, just reflect on um, Don's comment in the beginning about how we really uh, have seen a tremendous evolution in the extent to which we, uh, as a as a as a community, um, are now thinking about taking care of our own, caring caring for the caregivers, and um, and, and that's uh, critically a critically important evolution. And I would go so far as to say that what we experienced at Mount Sinai and the way in which we were adapt to it uh, quickly in response to COVID. Um, I, I firmly believe um, was uh, in, in many ways uh, we, were, we were capable of doing what we, what we ended up doing as a result of the infrastructure that existed prior, namely having an office of well-being and a chief wellness officer uh, amongst many other people in a large health system who could bring to bear some, some resources. But we, we already had that in place because of the recognition of how important uh, the well-being of, of clinicians uh, are. And so, um, and so, you know, I think uh, it's important to make that comment at the outset, uh, since it, it really did uh, influence our ability to to move. So, um, I believe you're you're looking at a slide that says the pandemic curve and associated stressors. 
uh, what I was asked to, to share today was our, our uh, actual experience in New York City. So uh, as many of you know, um, you know, New York uh, really was uh, the epicenter um, of, of this pandemic some, some weeks ago. Um, in fact, it's a little, a little bit eerie for us now when things are relatively calm to be reading about what's happening in, in other parts of the country. Uh, but certainly there was a good period of time there where um, we, we, you know, all, all eyes were on us in many ways. Um, and so what I'll describe for you is, you know, just like there's a pandemic curve, there are um, phases of, of stress response um, and, and stressors that become priorities in the midst of, of a pandemic that we observe firsthand. And it speaks to um, some of what, what Josh showed uh, as it relates to, to phases of, of response to crisis. So certainly in the beginning, as we were bracing for the patients to start coming in, but not having, not actually seeing large volumes yet, there was a huge amount of uh, disruption in society, much like we're still experiencing, although we are opening up in New York City. Um, but that disruption really, uh, you know, if you think about your, your uh, what's going to affect your well-being, it was all about basic needs, uh, because now things that were previously taken for granted uh, really rose to the fore. And those of you familiar with Maslow's hierarchy, you know, it's, it's the basic stuff that, that you need before you can, you can move up that, that hierarchy and, and, you know, get to a place of, of well-being. And so things like how do we get to work safely and am I going to be protected? Am I going to have, you know, enough personal protective equipment? And do I have to worry about bringing this infection home if I should get infected to my family? So all of these things, um, you know, were, were central at the start, and a lot of our efforts address that. And, you know, I, I've been struck by the power of uncertainty, which remains a, an extremely strong uh, force uh, and, and source of anxiety. And as those patients really started surging through our health system, at one point we had well over 2,000 in our eight hospital health system, um, it, it, the uncertainty of how large was this going to be and will I be redeployed and have the support to do a job different than what I was doing before, are we going to have the resources to take care of everyone? Um, these were uh, uh, questions and that, that uh, in the midst of uncertainty that led to great uh, stress. And then as we've entered the phase uh, which we're, we're in right now where um, the, the cases have dropped, and now there are estimates that prevalence in New York City is about 1% to 2%, uh, so we're really in a different place, you know, this is the chance when people t have, they take a breath and they begin to process what they've been through. And, uh, you know, Josh's slide, I, I think we're firmly in that sort of post-crisis disillusionment phase um, where th there's a lot of con concern about what our people are experiencing. You can go to the next slide. So, you know, we tried to match in real time um, the, uh, a response to each stressor. Uh, as they were unfolding. And so in the beginning, it was all about uh, creating uh, resources about meeting basic daily needs, as well as perhaps providing for some of those needs, which we did a lot of. Uh, simple things, but really important uh, to Josh's point. You know, if your stomach is grumbling, uh, that, that's going to be first and foremost. So we brought food, we created, uh, we, we procured PPE, we created child care resources, addressed transportation. And then again, in terms of the role of leadership, um, I have been struck by how incredibly important communication, honest, authentic, regular communications are in, in these times of crisis. Again, to that point of uncertainty. How do you address uncertainty and the anxiety that re results from it? Steady, good, authentic communications. And then I will say, in the phase we're in now, we really are worried about the psychosocial and mental health of our workforce. And, uh, and anticipate, we, are, we are already seeing a significant uptick in the needs and anticipate more that are forthcoming. And so, um, you know, as our mental health folks uh, at Mount Sinai say, everybody needs support in times of crisis and some will need treatment. And so it is our job to make sure that there's a broad array of support and treatment resources uh, that are available. And as you see on the slide, there's a lot of things that uh, were in existence that we made more accessible and other things that we ramped up in real time, proactive mental health liaisons, as an example, through our Department of Psychiatry, reaching out to the clinical units, um, as well as 24-7 phone lines, things of that nature. Um, next slide. I'm going to actually skip through this. This really just uh, addresses um, 
a model for uh, how to conceptualize what it is that we heard uh, when, when people were asked, both in formal focus groups and informally through our mechanisms at, at, uh, at Mount Sinai uh, and Stanford University. Um, next slide. There's that uh, adapted uh, Maslow's hierarchy there for you, just reflecting the basic needs and another reference for you that reflects on how it was we addressed basic needs, communication, and psychosocial support. That top reference there um, captures our, our effort if of interest. But I'll, I'll actually show you what it looks like on our website on the next slide. So if, uh, if you're viewing this that says well-being staff resources, uh, you know, one of the amazing things, again, the silver linings is that in a time of crisis, everybody comes together. And so um, we are a large health system, eight hospitals across uh, New York City and, and, and other, you know, outer areas. And um, in this time, basically, we, we leveraged all our resources. Our entire digital health team and web-based web team stopped what they were doing and created a new website and created a space for well-being resources. And we organized them um, by basic needs, mental health, psychosocial support, and on-the-ground resources. Um, you can go to the next slide. And so you can see how, how it was organized. This is just to give you a sense of what it is that we did to try to address the needs. Again, in real time, a lot of people work in a lot of hours, uh, an enormous amount of intensity. Again, speaking to how where we are now and, and there being a lot of fatigue and exhaustion, myself included. Uh, but we organized a lot of these things based on how we thought people were looking for them and what we were hearing on the ground. Uh, so you see all the kind of things that fit in basic needs, all the kind of things that fit in mental health and psychosocial support. And um, we tried to organize them in a way that we thought people would look for them, whether you're looking for actual crisis support or one-on-one -on -one or group-based discussions. Some people want spiritual care. Um, so that's kind of how we organized it. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is another amazing uh, effort that came out of uh, what it is that we did, a partnership you know, and oftentimes in these situations, um, you, you never know uh, who's going to sort of be connected to you and what's going to really resonate and lead to something. But um, we have a really talented team through our uh, Department of Rehab and Human Performance, um, and they were able to, in rapid fashion, set up what they call recharge rooms. Again, speaking to the need for, ba uh, for basic needs, um, we created these spaces. I say we. I, I really, all I had to do with it was I found these incredibly talented people and we were able to get some philanthropic support. Um, but once that happened, these groups were up and running and they created these recharge rooms. If it looks like you're, you're, you're seeing a picture or, or perhaps uh, feel like you might be in the rainforest in that shot, it's because that's how you feel when you go into these rooms. They are immersive sight, sound, smell, taste experiences where in a matter of 10 minutes, you are completely removed from the clinical setting and you have recharge. Sometimes the facility dog will come by the, the extent to which this resonated with our workforce was truly uh, astonishing. For me, as, as someone who, you know, really thought that we need to focus on, on mental health and psychosocial support, but this just highlighted how in times of crisis, it's basic needs. You just need that, that break, that break room. Uh, next slide. So this, this is, my, is my last one speaking to our, our uh, experience. Uh, hopefully you got a sense that um, we were able to build off a lot of concepts um, and understanding uh, and really uh, try to, to the extent that we could um, create support uh, on an ongoing basis, have rapid, honest uh, communication about that and make it accessible. And we're actually delighted that, that this is going to uh, lead to a, a much more robust um, employee well-being support system well beyond uh, COVID. We were already doing a lot um, as it related to, to my having an office and now there, there's, there's a lot more. Um, but I think what we understood is that, you know, the approach to well-being, it almost certainly requires a pivot. That's what we, we talk about. So we had the infrastructure. We were able to, uh, to, to pivot our resources to address what the needs were, which were somewhat different um, in, in the midst of the crisis. And now we're pivoting back uh, to some of the things we were doing, but not um, entirely because there are some, some lingering effects. And what I will say is that the, probably the issue that was um, relevant before COVID and remains um, relevant throughout is, is that uh, area around culture of, of well-being. And central to that are the communication efforts, 
and the uh, behaviors of our leaders. Critically important whether you're in a, in a crisis or not. Um, that that's going to really help um, um, dictate how, how the culture is uh, within your workforce. Um, we, we know that there's burden. We have data, which, which I can't speak to in great detail because it's unpublished. Um, but suffice it to say, we sent surveys measuring symptoms of PTSD, depression, and anxiety and found significant burden as anticipated within our workforce. And as a result of that, you know, I said that before, everyone needs support, some will need treatment. We are continuing many of our initiatives uh, into this next phase um, with lots of resources and ongoing uh, efforts to make sure communication is central. We're now moving into a phase where we're focusing on a mental health destigmatization campaign uh, and, and encouraging our leaders to speak openly and honestly and authentically about the impact that this is having on them. The last comment I'll make is uh, we've been fortunate that some philanthropic dollars have now been dedicated to a new Center for Stress, Resilience, and Personal Growth, which is, uh, what, which is another effort that's up and, and uh, underway that will really focus on the mental health needs of our workforce um, as a result of COVID and provide screening, um, referrals, and resilience training uh, and coaching. Uh, so we're really lucky uh, that, that we have that in place. We recognize that in, in times like these, to be able to have these resources, um, it is, it, we're, we're truly fortunate. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and, uh, and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan Ripp. Uh, thank uh, Jonathan and Joshua both. Um, we're going to turn now just before we go to uh, chat to Derek Feely uh, for some of what, you know, Derek, you heard. Uh, you've been involved along with Jess Perlow who helped uh, shape this show uh, with a lot of health systems working on uh, well-being, burnout, uh, joy and work. Um, what are some of your thoughts uh, at this particular moment in time? Thanks, Derek. Well, thanks, Madge, and uh, thanks to both uh, Joshua and John. Uh, so much in what they said really uh, resonated with me. Um, maybe turning to this first slide, John's point about the importance of communication, uh, of talking to each other, of listening to each other, of, of keeping every communication channel open. Uh, and it's that communication that led us to think that perhaps a starting point for um, conversations about building joy and work began with asking staff that question about what matters to you. Um, I suspect many of them would have said also, I really need a place to recharge. That's one of the things that matters to me. Um, if, if, if you go to the next slide, um, Rachel, uh, and, and what Joshua, Joshua was saying, um, the, the idea that this takes a kind of whole systems response, that this is a complex problem with no simple solution, and there are things that leaders need to do, there are things that our core managers need to do, and there are things that every one of us can take responsibility for, we can pay some attention to our uh, our psychological uh, first aid. Um, and it, as, as we've been doing this work, a couple of other things have, have become clear to us. And again, there were uh, uh, hints and references to this in both uh, what Joshua said and what John said. One of the things that we're discovering is really important for people, people who can thrive in these, despite these crisis situations and come through these things uh, strongly have what uh, Aaron Antonovsky calls a sense of coherence. Um, they, uh, and he, what he means by that is they, they, um, they have a level of understanding about what it is that's required of them. The, they find their situation manageable, so they, have, they feel as if they have the supports that both Joshua and John described. Um, and third, they get meaning from the work. Uh, and if, if we can create, a, through using some of the materials that Joshua and John have shared with us, if we can create a system where people get a sense of coherence, where you know, they, they understand what, what's expected of them, they feel supported in that activity, and they get meaning from it, um, then I think we're more likely to get people 
through the other side of this um, in, a, in a relatively more healthy kind of way. Two other things, Madge, just before um, I, I close. I, I really liked uh, Joshua's point about hope. I think that's one of the real leadership jobs in, uh, in uh, events like this, in, in times of crisis. Um, and there's a, there's a delicate balance often to be struck between transparency and, and people... People want to be told the truth, um, but they also want to know that there's something better on the other side. Uh, and uh, that's one of the things I think we, we would ask leaders to do. Um, and then there was John's point about in times of crisis, everyone comes together, uh, which is right, uh, of course. But it made me think, um, what would it take for us to be able to say, in times of calm, everybody comes together? And there must be learning we can distill from this time that would help us figure out how, in times of calm, everybody could come together. Uh, thanks, Joshua and, and John. I learned a huge amount over the last 15 minutes, and uh, I'm sure that every listener did too. And uh, Madge, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Derek. Um, couldn't agree more. Uh, folks in the chat um, are starting to ask some questions, which is great. So follow their lead and uh, chat to all participants. Um, I'm going to throw in one question uh, first, I think, back to Joshua, uh, maybe feeding off a little bit of what you just heard from John. Um, he mentioned that one of the things that he and his team learned was that uncertainty was a lot more powerful, almost and potent, um, an issue um, than maybe anticipated. And I wondered if you, Joshua, I guess from your research and what you understand, um, what you reflect on that, um, given that uncertainty, at least <laughs> with this first go around with the pandemic, uh, we'll have to see what other kinds of things come next. Um, it was kind of hard to get rid of that uncertainty and people really needed. So what thoughts do you have about uncertainty um, and the role um, that system supports and leaders can play? Um, well, certainly uncertainty is um, a hallmark of pandemics, um, and we know this from historical experiences with pandemics and other global outbreaks. Um, uncertainty accompanied by fear, and that this uncertainty um, is what often drives people's behaviors. Um, you know, uncertainty really makes it difficult to plan, whether that's planning for what one's going to do after work planning for what one's going to get at the grocery store, um, planning for a vacation. And those elements of being able to plan are part of how many of us sustain hope to go forward each and every day. So a very, uh, a dramatic disruption in a sense of certainty interrupts that process. And I think the issues around um, certainly around communication with people and messaging with people um, that balance truthfulness of information with a, uh, a focus on moving forward and looking to the future and what needs to be done are important ingredients in helping manage uncertainty. I also think it's particularly challenging for those of us who are caregivers or healthcare providers because uh, many of us have a bit more of a perfectionistic tendency. We tend to want to get it right. And part of what it means to lead in a crisis is making decisions with less than perfect information. Not once, not twice, but all day, every day. Um, and I think that that really challenges um, how we as healthcare providers, that, perfect, that particular profession, um, are taught to behave in our day-to-day -day work lives. So understanding that uncertainty is part of it and any tolerance for uncertainty is a, an important skill for leaders to develop, to understand that they won't be able to get it all right 
nor will they have all of the answers or be able to take away all of the uncertainty um, for the people who work for them. And I think those are new things for many people who are in leadership positions at all levels to be thinking about. People are often selected to be leaders because of how they perform under daily operations. Um, and crisis events like this tax those in very unique ways. That's an interesting point, um, and one will probably be with us uh, moving forward. Thank you, Joshua. Jonathan, I'm going to try and combine a couple of different points um, maybe here. So, and maybe there is this, uh, a few people here in the chat who are re, um, expressing some of the anxiety that's still going on about returning to work um, and the reopening. Um, if patients and families are trying to navigate, so are many people in the workforce and uh, trying to trust what they're being told about safety. Um, so I'm curious if this is something that Mount Sinai is dealing with. And then maybe I can tack on to that, Jonathan, a question. Uh, you talked about that recharge room and that space, um, and some people are wondering, did, in fact, a lot of people use it? I think there's been an experience of people setting up some things that didn't quite, you know, seem to fit the bill. Um, so anything on that, too. Thanks. Sure, sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just reflect on uh, – I'll answer both those questions and, uh, and, and make a comment which, which will highlight one of the takeaways I made. Uh, earlier, um, that almost all of these questions uh, can in some way, shape, or form be answer, the answer almost always is around communications and leadership, uh, which, which to me is, uh, I, I knew about the importance of that, um, but it's just, it's, and this, this for me will clearly, it's risen in, in priority and will stay that way. And so, um, you know, I was I was mentioning the phases of the pandemic and that as there was the surge of patients, there was a lot of uncertainty about what, you know, just how big is this thing going to be? Well, um, you know, in many ways that's been answered, uh, at least for this first uh, stage here in New York City. Um, but there's a huge amount of existing uncertainty about a, a whole array of issues, not the least of which are, are what you just brought up about return to work. Um, and safety, and, you know, there's probably 50 questions you could ask related to that. Because of that, um, what Mount Sane has done has literally created a safety hub uh, website um, because, uh, and, and the way this is being um, messaged out as a resource by leaders is, and I, I heard this just the other day by the head of our ambulatory, ambulatory care, this is your source of truth. And so um, it's critical that people not only know where to go to get their questions answered, but feel that they can rely on it. And, and we need to do our parts uh, to, to ensure that people feel that they can, they can trust it. I, I'd like to think that within our health system, people do, do trust the information that's, that's propped up there. Um, so, you know, and then, you know, a lot of our, our infection prevention people have been very busy and they've been, uh, talking a lot and sharing a lot about, uh, you know, questions with regards to return to work and, and safety. Uh, the recharge rooms, yeah, you know, um, they've been enormously popular. I, I could imagine, uh, I could imagine it swinging both ways, and I sort of spoke to that uh, earlier on, that I, you know, it, this wasn't exactly something that was, uh, you know, in my, it still is in, in, in my, you know, particular skill set. I just, I was lucky to find the right people. Um, but I think because they were, they're so talented, um, it was one of those things where, a few people started going to it and uh, going to the, the first one, and they thought this is amazing uh, that it just became word of mouth. And actually, the, the major problem we had was not getting people to go, but you know, actually maintaining social distancing and and all that. When when people were in these places, we had to you know have people there that were continually reminding everyone to that you know you got to and we were managing flows and, and that sort of thing. But there, you know, from the start, uh, there's just been a steady flow that continues, and we've now we now have them at six of our eight hospitals, and pretty soon we'll have them at, at eight of our eight hospitals, and they've just been enormously successful. But I think that's it's sort of ha how you do it, um, how you arrange it, and then how you how you message it. Too. Thank you. Uh, interesting. Uh, the um, 
got to really keep up with all those snacks, too. <laughs> um, Joshua, um, maybe, I don't know if you can uh, also see the chat here. Um, I don't know what we call this phase of um, – People uh, kind of first, uh, maybe there was that moment of joy uh, that somebody else was asking about, Jonathan, feeling very good about the recharge uh, area, for instance. And then to Joshua, um, good good vibes and good feelings were um, kind of uh, deteriorating and sort of more anger and conflict and resentments, um, you know, even as um, – so, in, in fact, as – time goes on. So it may not be or, you know, in the um, treatment, you know, uh, bucket here, um, but uh, a lot of different feelings. So I'm just curious, what what has been your experience with that? And is that a, an, a phase that can be anticipated, in fact? Um, things that happened, still not quite processed. Certainly. Um, many career fields or other professions that endure sustained operations um, result in people having a variety of experiences. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, disaster and crisis events really expose the fault lines in our society, and kind of pull back pre-existing vulnerabilities um, and expose differences or perceived differences. So in healthcare systems where people felt that risks were distributed um, inequitably, um, or on teams where there were pre-existing difficulties in terms of communication or cohesion. Those types of things um, would be more likely to um, result in difficulties or challenges in terms of functioning and or feelings of resentment or anger. Um, you know, words matter a lot here. And when I talk to healthcare providers, when you talk about issues of being angry, a lot of people say I'm not angry. When you ask people if they're resentful, that's a word people identify with. And there are many things that may have occurred in different healthcare settings where perhaps they didn't get it right um, the way that or take a lot of the steps that the Sinai healthcare system did with such an intense and, and laser focus on the well-being of their healthcare workers. Um, and certainly people have varied and different experiences as well that they're bringing to this. So, um, we, you know, it's important to remember that, that we only see a portion of an individual in front of us. So when we're looking at what our system is doing and offering, there are many things that an organization and a leader can do, but there are also individual factors. And all of these things, whether somebody's coming from a home where they, their child was just diagnosed with cancer, or their spouse just told them that they're leaving them, or their spouse just lost their job, or like for many people, they just became a surprise, you're a teacher now at home, um, and you have these altered home and work dynamics. Um, all of those kinds of things contribute to people's network of stressors. And it's that network of stressors balanced against other factors that buffer against them that ultimately um, result in someone's life experience. And that's not a static thing either. It's a dynamic thing that changes for people over time. Mm -hmm. So varied experiences over varied periods of time, um, influenced by things at work, the people who lead in that place, and, and the things that people bring with them from home. To the degree that a leader understands their people's network of stressors, it puts them in a more unique position to effectively support the particular specific issues that are going on for each of their people. Um, I saw that. Thank you, Joshua. I see, Derek, your your um, video lit up, and I know Don is still there, too, so I want to invite either one of you uh, certainly to jump in. Um, typically, you're not shy on with me on that front, so uh, please do uh, if there is something uh, that occurs to you. Um, I, th I think I have one question maybe for you, Derek, as somebody who's been also in a lot of leadership positions. Um, how? D what have you found uh, over the year? How do people get over uh, if, if they're disappointed or they feel that you maybe did not, um, you know, divulge maybe enough or it, there wasn't uh, adequate um, honesty or something, um, how repairable is, is, are those kinds of things? And, and just if you've had any experience with that. I'm not accusing you, by the way, of any of that. <laughs> That's good. I'm, glad. I'm glad about that, Madge. Um, 
So I do think this, this issue of trust and how do you re-establish it is, uh, is going to be a really important one for us. Um, because the trust is hard to build and it's easy to destroy. Uh, you, you just need to, um, uh, one uh, error or false step and, uh, and, and a lot of time and energy that you've spent trying to create a trusting environment gets um, damaged. Uh, and so trust is something I think that we, we, we sometimes make the mistake of thinking about in episodic terms. The stuff that, you know, there's, it's large gestures and, uh, and instead I think it's much more incremental and, uh, and something that is nurtured over time rather than created in kind of, uh, grand, grandiose episodes. Uh, and so the only way to get it, to get it back if you lose it is to invest in, in building it every, every single day. It should just be part of uh, our, our work as leaders. And actually, most of the things that um, I, I look back over my leadership career and, and regret are things that I didn't do or say. Uh, they're, not th they're not things I, I did or said. I've made my share of mistakes, much like everybody else, but uh, I don't really have too many regrets about, about those. I did all of them with the best of intents. And then there were a couple of things where um, I, I could have been more transparent. I could have told people a, a, a little bit more than I did. Uh, and I wish now in hindsight that I had. Uh, and, uh, and so, I, you know, there's, I think especially in times of, of difficulty and crisis, there's almost no limit to the amount of investment that a leader needs to make in in transparency, uh, in trust building, and in uh, in the in the kind of creation of hopefulness. It's also one other thing I think is really important in all of these circumstances. I think it goes to this issue about uh, about trust, Madge, and that's uh, calm. But people people I think have a legitimate expectation that in the face of all of this kind of maelstrom and, and I, 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 there's a comment in the chat with which I really did, which did re really resonate with me about the layering of stress. So, you know, we, um, we have the stress of COVID-19 right now. We also have the stress of everything that's going on um, with uh, in, inequity and injustice uh, in the United States and elsewhere in the world right now. Those, those are, have a layering effect. Um, and uh, leaders must not panic in those situations. They, they need to stay calm. Thanks, Derek. And I appreciate also um, mentioning what all the other things going on right now. There have been some questions in the chat about the relationship uh, between everything folks have gone through in the pandemic and then police brutality and uh, people in the streets and a lot of distress about societal uh, issues and ills in our society um, right now. Don, you apparently have a question. Go for it. Yeah, Madge, thanks. It's a question I'm getting asked actually quite a lot lately uh, that I'd love to hear John and Joshua pine on if they have a minute. It's how do we keep what we want to keep? Um, it's hard in this crisis to look beyond the crisis, but someday, hopefully, COVID will be behind us. Um, and there's a lot of good things that will have come out of this tragedy. And the two of you have described some of the systems, the, the, the compassion, the new awareness of each other, and many other things. Do you have any, any ideas from your experience about how now to set the stage for keeping what we want to keep? And that's a question I've probably been asked five or six times just in the past few days. Uh, let me uh, maybe Jonathan you talked a little bit about um, sort of look all the things that have been um, set up uh, at Mount Sinai um, a bunch of that gonna stick around and do you how would you respond to Don's question yeah I, I mean it, it's a great question uh, particularly in light of our uh, 
you know, firm belief that we've, we've learned an enormous amount um, in, in the midst of all this. So uh, we, we want to keep certain things. Um, I mean, I can speak to it in some uh, um, sort of level of granularity about specific things we want to keep, but then the larger question about how do you kind of make the case for keeping things that, that seem to work, um, perhaps particularly when there are other um, uh, and this is this is the world that, that I and others are, are living in. There are competing interests. You know, um, we need to pay attention to racial equity and justice um, uh, right now. And so there's attention is being spread in, in many directions. And then how do you keep initiatives that might have a cost associated with them when we're really in times of, of austerity and, and, and financial uncertainty? So um, all of those things are going to are going to sort of be uh, at work here. You know, the simple question, or not not so simple, but, um, you know, I think as, a re as it relates to things that need to stay, we need to maintain, in our view, at Mount Sinai, at least some element of the proactive outreach and support that we put in place in the middle of the uh, pandemic uh, surge because of the recognition that there's always, and this gets to your comment about um, Dr. Green's suicide, you know, I mean, we always worry about the people, more so about the people we don't hear from than the people that we do hear from. Uh, if someone's reaching out for help, that's that's a good thing. We know there are others out there that are that are suffering that that don't. And so um, I think we learned that, and and um, and that's gonna that's gonna stick around. And I mentioned the new center that's coming. Um, also, a lot of that is you know there's so many variables that influence the ability to put these things in place in the first place, and then to keep them. Uh, and you know my my earlier comment, having an infrastructure with a chief wellness officer who can be the voice and advocate for these things as I do and try to build a coherent case. So that's actually a lot of the work of the chief wellness officer is demonstrating where there are priorities um, and how they overlap in an institution. Because, you know, leader, the, the top leaders of an institution have multiple priorities. So um, we need to be able to speak that language. Um, I, I think now more than ever, uh, the well-being of the workforce is recognized. And so to make a case to keep all those things, there were plenty of reasons to do it. Prior to all this, not the least of which are the moral imperative, the regulatory environment, the business case, but now more than ever, you know, it's concerns about the mental health consequences of our workforce, uh, you know, working through a pandemic and collect data to show that um, and add that to, you know, get up there as if you're in a courtroom arguing for, for what you need. Um, I, you know, that, that's what I feel like I do a lot. Unfortunately, I'm in a place um, where that's often heard. Well, Jonathan, thank you very much, and we'll definitely have to uh, come back to you and uh, see see how these things, some of these things, uh, work out. Uh, we are getting close to the end here, uh, but Joshua, why don't you uh, give us the last word on that uh, question? How do we kind of keep uh, what actually uh, need has worked and needs to be built upon? Well, sustaining system change is going to be challenging. I think, as um, others are alluding to. There's going to be a lot of competing forces at work for our attention and a drift back to the status quo. I mean, things were the way they were for a reason. Um, one of the things that's helpful, and perhaps as a, as a, a mental health professional, my mind goes to, um, there are things over which we have influence, there are things over which we have control, and there are things over which we have neither. And knowing which is which can often help us um, figure out where to put our energy for each, each one of us. whether that is um, a big system change because you work in policy or whether you are a team leader in an ICU um, who decides that you want everybody to have a battle buddy or you want to have post-shift team huddles to help correct distortions, share information, and develop uh, actionable lessons learned at the end of each shift that your team uses to enhance their performance um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there are all kinds of things that people can do at their level um, and sometimes being mindful and comfortable with understanding what we can influence uh, is a way to help both focus our efforts and reduce our frustration. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, we have reached the end of our time together for this program. I want to uh, thank everybody for a lot of the questions in the chat. You know, this series is going to continue. I'll say more about that in just a second. So some of these issues, including, I think, Jonathan, you know, flagging uh, that, you know, there are some 
definite deep things going on for a number of people, as your surveys have suggested, and sort of we don't want to ignore that some people will need more than just uh, support, uh, but perhaps uh, more intervention um, and certainly deserve it. There is this survey to your right, uh, and if you look at, at the screen here, and we do hope you'll let us know uh, what the program offered you today and what we can always do uh, to make it better. I want to say a big thank you uh, to uh, Joshua Morgenstein, uh, Jan excuse me, Jonathan Ripp, Don Berwick, and Derek Feely, and also shout out to Jess Perlow for help with this program. And thank you, audience, for taking the time uh, to participate. And you can get the entire show today and all the related resources on IHI.org. Check later today or over the weekend. Um, and we also have a, a big archive of these uh, virtual learning hours on IHI.org. The special focus of virtual learning hours, Caring for Caregivers, and that's a partnership with Wellbeing Trust, uh, continues on a biweekly basis from July 10th through September 11th, and it will continue to feature topics related to the prevention, prediction, and mitigation of poor mental health and well-being amongst caregivers, and you can learn more on IHI.org, and there's a slide up there uh, reminding you of all that information. It's been my honor to moderate this important discussion. I wish everyone good health. Thank you for your time and participation for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. I'm Madge Kaplan.